All right, everybody, welcome back to Matt Money. Today, we are fortunate to have Ross Sklar, who is the CEO of two different companies here with us today. So let's just kind of jump right into the interview and talk a little bit about Starco Brands. But you also have a different company as well. So uh, I'd like to, I guess, first ask you to tell us about yourself and then tell us a little bit about uh, the two companies that you're involved with. Sure. And, uh, and thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I started my career um, formulating uh, corrosion inhibitors in the oil and gas arena uh, in mm -hmm. Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, and um, the focus is really on uh, inhibitors that were considered to be volatile so that they uh, could work in sort of a, a wide variety of environments uh, in mm -hmm. oil and gas. And, and was kind of a more effective and safer way to do something rather than, you know, slapping a ton of hydrocarbons on something where it had, you know, environmental concerns and safety uh, concerns and waste concerns. Sure. And so, yeah, it, um, it allowed, it allowed the user to really, um, take something that was just a really heavy cost burden and actually, you know, create something that was healthy for a system and, and allowed them to monetize their assets a lot easier. And so, so before I really knew what I was doing early in the game, we had developed some unique intellectual property. Um, we'd started to license that technology. And so, <clears throat> yeah, so very early on in the, in my career, I, I sort of knew that I had, um, some formulary capabilities where I could really analyze the situation from a technical standpoint and solve it uh, from a, from a formulary standpoint. And I, and I mm -hmm. could, you know, do it relatively quickly right. in the head. I could sort of, you know, almost sort of see the stoichiometry, if you will. And, and you yeah. kind of exercise that muscle over time. Um, right. And, and the way to really exercise that muscle is that is, is you, you've got to know, you know, your raw materials. I mean, as a baker, you're only as good as your ingredients. And so I sort of became a raw material nut uh, and really studied those markets uh, very thoroughly. Um, but I was entrepreneurial. And so I, you know, had somewhat of a capability to see the white space and see opportunities. And so because I had success early on creating a formulary solution and then licensing it, I kind of doubled down mm -hmm. and I saw some other opportunities and tried to formulate products that would solve those problems and had some success and I created the first ever, um, water-based architectural paint that was zero VOC that you could paint directly over microbiological life, things like mold, mildew, algae, fungi, ah, yeah. and it would disinfect the surface, but then it would also prevent regrowth for up to two years. And I had that product approved by the EPA to go ahead and make those claims. And that was an arduous process to say the yeah, least. Yeah. Ignorance is bliss like when you start a process like that, but I was lucky enough to get get through those hoops. And then I ended up licensing that technology to uh, a Fortune 100 uh, business, a couple billion dollar coding manufacturer, one of the largest in the world. Uh, and so I had built up a pretty healthy licensing portfolio. Um, mm -hmm. And and early success is a, is a double edged sword. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I thought that it was, um, you know, I kind of hit a back to back to back home runs. And I thought, right. well, this is what I'll do for the rest of my life. Um, but then there were some other technologies that I was trying to commercialize and license and I was having some difficulty. And it was at that point that I decided that I really um, wanted my own manufacturing platform. And then I made, you know, close to 20 acquisitions uh, in about a decade and started oh. to acquire aerosol facilities and liquid fill facilities and personal care facilities uh, pharmaceutical, um, also in food and also in beverage and in spirits. And so today we have, you know, somewhere around 13, 14, 15 facilities across the nation. Oh, wow. And, and that business is called the Starco group. Um, and it's, it's a cross category manufacturer that, 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 um, is, is really in the consumer products landscape, but we touch almost every single category. So from paints, coatings, adhesives, to household air care, to disinfectants, uh, into personal care, um, you know, things like shampoos, body wash, wash off products, things of that nature, right. creams, et cetera. And then into FDA personal care, where we do a lot of the OTCs, over the counter pharmaceuticals, including sunscreen and 
things of that nature. We also do cooking sprays. We do whipped creams. <laughs> and then we have beverage and, and spirits as well. But that, that entire business is really private label. Right. So we manufacture for the big brands. We also manufacture for uh, the big retailers and their brands. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of this pretty extensive infrastructure mm-hmm. with, you know, customer service and account management and logistics and <laughs> finance and warehousing and fulfillment and R and D and, you know, extreme, you know, production and, and the capability to supply at scale. So, right. so, so since we really had that and we had the ability to generate intellectual property really for line extension for a lot of the big brands. We sort of got this reputation of kind of being somewhat of an invention factory over time. Right. Makes and, perfect sense. And so that you know, we'd go to them, we'd go to the big brands or retailers and say, Hey, we've got the next, you know, greatest widget. We think this really, you know, can give you a competitive advantage and so on. But after a certain point in the ball game, we started to realize that we were missing the boat regarding truly monetizing that those pieces of IP underneath, you know, a portfolio of our own brands. Right. Um, and so that started to become the impetus or the vertice of how Starco brands started. And so, really you know, cool. we really yeah. wanted that to be a separate company and, and it would be sort of a company where we wanted to curate the right vision. And, and ultimately the mission statement of the company became that Starco brands will only commercialize behavior changing products, meaning it will we'll never produce a me too. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? So it has to be cutting edge. It has to have the capability of changing behavior. And if it doesn't have those characteristics, it just simply won't make the cut. So it's, it's real innovation and it's cross category. Cause that's the capabilities that we, that we have. Right. Um, and lastly, after, you know, a lot of thought and diligence and, you know, because on the private side, look, we're very well versed in, you know, debt financing, we're very well versed in private equity and venture capital and growth equity. We've got a very firm grip on how to finance certain initiatives. Um, we're very frugal operators. We pay, you know, very close attention to, you know, net income rather than just sales, 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 right? We really understand what the bottom line means. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and that makes you know, perfect sense because when you're, when you're doing some of this work for say a PNG or somebody like yourself, your, your money is made off of the margin, right? That you can really take by bottling and, and doing all that work for them. So 100%. that makes perfect sense. hundred percent. And if you're a bad co-packer and you can't manage your costs, you're not going to be in yeah. business very long. So, <laughs> no, so, so, so you really have to have efficiencies during that OEM process all the way cradle to grave from, you know, R and D bank, you know, lab bench testing all the way to, to commercialization. And then you have to manage your capital by, also kind of managing the ebbs and flows of their business because then you're going to have mm-hmm. to make some hedging and some bets because you know you could you know stack up on inventory all of a sudden they go to business and you're left holding the bag so you got to be really right. careful you know as a co-packer but it's that frugality and it's that manufacturing efficiencies that we could really grab onto and utilize to our advantage when we think about how are we going to brand some of this stuff um and then lastly because we knew that finance world so well, we made a very conscious decision that we wanted Starco Brands to be a public company for, mm-hmm. for a variety of, of reasons, for a variety of reasons. And, and so this you know, could take our conversation into you know, <laughs> what we're developing and valuations and how valuations are looked at in that market versus the private right. market. So, but there was a, a variety of, of reasons why we chose that. And, um, and so it's been a hell of a ride and we're kind of like, this is our third year in it and you know the business is starting to scale so it's 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 an amazing journey that that's been that's an absolutely phenomenal description and it's perfectly clear to me so hopefully it's clear to the audience what i really want to know is uh going from steerco group to now steerco brands has there you kind of touched on it a good bit but i'm just curious if there's anything specific and really crunchy that you want to mention about so it's just tr- the strategic shift or that you've kind of either undergone from say 2016, 2017, when you've kind of branched off and started going into Steerco brands, or is it something where you've kind of made that shift already and now you're really trying to go from 2020 to 2025, really shift differently into to a different avenue? Look, as being a fiduciary for both companies, they 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 both have very distinct and separate 
visions and missions. Right. And they're both slaves to different masters per se, right? So, so once we kind of crafted the vision of Starco brands, once that really came into full view, we really understood that that's a very different skill set than what's required to run a great manufacturing business. And, and so that's going to require different core competencies. That's going to require a different team. That's going to require different partnerships. And so that strategy had to be thought of in a very new and very different light. Now, the synergy between the companies is obviously clear because this is a big manufacturing and R&D and so on and so forth. And the whole back end is essentially taken care of. But the front end from the you know, focus groups of how something is going to be designed or positioned, whether a product, you know, is worthy enough to make the cut. And we think that the market is large enough. Um, You know, how is this product going to be financed regarding its own marketing, its own aesthetics, its in-store marketing, all the things that are required. How are we going to deal with retailers differently? Because as a co-packer, even on private label, there's certain costs associated with doing business with retail, but as a brand, there's way different costs and marketing rebates and all these sorts of things. And then how, how are you going to finance the marketing even further than that? The pull through marketing, the media, the social, the digital, the D to C strategies. So these were all new buckets that all required a brand new approach. Mm-hmm. That's uh, that's really wise. Yeah, that's 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 a really interesting way to put it. Uh, I really, uh, really admire kind of how you went from strictly saying, hey, well, we have the infrastructure to really build something that can really take this. I guess co-packing business to a whole nother level and really utilize them as a, as a great partnership between the two. But exactly like you mentioned, they're two completely different businesses, two completely different objectives, but they're very symbiotic in that respect. So that's uh, that's true. that's really awesome. But m- switching more towards Starco brands itself. So I really appreciate the fact that you kind of laid out both the distinction between both companies. Uh, is there an end goal for the organization? What do you envision? at the very end for Starco Brands. Do you want to build it up to be like a, a, a Procter & Gamble on its own, or do you want it to be something different? I, listen, I'll start, I'll start by saying this. I come from very humble beginnings. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the Starco group, the private side, is large. Yeah. Okay. And... At this stage of the ball game, and really throughout my entire career since when I started this thing when I was, you know, early 20s, I don't believe in having goals unless they're audacious. All right, all right. Okay. So you mentioned, you know, do we want to build it as big as P&G or a Unilever or something of that nature? Right, all right. The reality is, is that if we were setting out to build a small enterprise, someone may say, hey, Ross, you know, I'm going to charge you as not being a fiduciary for the company because, because, and I'm saying fiduciary for the, for the other company, because it would be, it's going to be sort of stealing me away and stealing some of the brain trust and the time to work on something. So unless it has, it it really, it must be something very large and very audacious for it to be worth my time. Right. Right. Because we've got such a large organization on, on the other side. So, so the way that this organization is now set up is that, look, there's been a lot of companies out there that have said, hey, we've got the next best widget and it's a single product and we're going to develop a line or whatever it is. And that's its sort of, you know, uh, I, I would say uh, a line in the sand or this is, its, this is its highway, this is its path, and this is what it's going to become. And maybe they do a great job and maybe it's valued high and maybe it divests and they're very happy because they've exited and got a good paycheck. Mm-hmm. That's not the strategic plan here. We, 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 we're, we're, well, we're already there. Right. So the strategic plan is yes. The goal is to build a diversified 21st century CPG company, right? right? We're, and the reason why we can say that that's a goal, the reason why we feel that's an achievable goal is because we already have the manufacturing core competencies to produce in a variety of different categories, right? We're in household. We're in air care, we're in disinfectants, we're in food, we're in beverage, we're in spirits. So, 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 so show me a comp of a company that is that diversified and small, 
It doesn't really exist. You kind of have to point to the big boys. You got to point to the Unilevers. You got to point to that. And and truthfully, nobody's really even dared to try to create kind of a 21st century CPG company of that size in the last 30 or 40 years because mm -hmm. it takes so much effort to be able to build or access all that diversified manufacturing. Like you can't just snap your fingers. It took me 20 years to build that. Yeah. Right. So to, to the extent that we have the infrastructure to do it, now it's a strategic marketing game. It's a finance and a strategic marketing game. So we already have the pieces of the board to be able to go out and say, hey, we're going to build a diversified leading edge CPG company. Now it's really a marketing game. And to the extent that we're curating our own intellectual property, and if that intellectual property makes the cut, meaning it's unique and it's behavior changing, the rest is strategic marketing and finance. So I was just saying, you know, we got a, a real strategic shot to build something that that is that big. You know, there there has been a couple that have tried. There's a company called Hain Celestial that's an amazing company and so well respected. Hain's doing well, yeah. Doing very well, and they're a diversified CPG company, and they're looked at as a little bit leading edge, safer for you kind of products and organic and this and that, whatever. And they're in say personal care and food. So there's there's that kind of example to point to, but they're far and few between. You know, we deal with some other investment banks, right? And some of the bigger investment banks, when they take a look at us and they really want to understand what's under the cover, first they'll take a look at Starco brands and say, okay, you know, what categories are you playing in and why do you think you can play in them? And so it starts to open a conversation about, well, let's look at Starco brands' core competencies for marketing and media. And so they say, okay, well, Ross, you're, uh, you know, you're a technical guy. You're a manufacturing guy. You built this, right. you know, big private label company over there. What constitutes you as a, as a pro or as an expert? And you want to go up against these big guys in marketing and media. So say, Tell us about well, how, you know, how can you do that? So from an, from an analytical vantage point, you know, an investment banker wants to cover the stock. They want to say, Hey, you know, wh why do you think that you're going to be able to get, and, and the answer is this, I always have said that. Sometimes I'll look around in a boardroom and I'll say, look, guys, if I'm the smartest guy in the boardroom, we have a real problem. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and what that means is, is that you have to understand that, A, what you're good at and B, what you're not, but be able to stand back and have the vision of saying, OK, well, this is what's required. And so what we did is instead of just kind of running around and going for the best hire and kind of building the team at its early stage we said that we want to partner with world-class best-in-class firms and we did a deal with a company called ipg and ipg is one of the world's largest advertising agency holding companies you got companies out there like ipg and omnicon these are several billion dollar entities that own you know massive sort of advertising companies and pr companies they're very large holding groups. And the idea was, is that if we could bring in a best in class marketing agency and have them act as our agency of, of record to produce all the graphic design and the labels and the marketing and the digital and the social and everything that you would require, if they could do that and do that because they were a vested partner in the company, that means that the parties are now shoulder to shoulder. And that's right. a very different relationship than just, you know, vendor paper services. All right. So we were able to bring in these deals based on a the infrastructure that we we're going to be exploiting, the mission statement and the plan, the products and the IP, and and being able to wrap that all together, which is very extensive, and being able to say, look, we're all going to exploit that together, but you guys do what you do best, and we'll do what we do. All right. So we were able to bring them in, and then and then secondarily, we did a very similar deal on the other side of the curve. So we really thought about it as boxes, right? You kind of in the middle box, you have the Starco Group manufacturing, the invention of intellectual property, all the infrastructure, all the logistics, all the vendor numbers at retail, the sales force, the, 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 the account management, all that central right. large infrastructure that you need. We sort of have that in the middle. Then you have the marketing agency of record box that helps with all that sort of stuff. And then there was another big box that we wanted to fill. And that was media. We wanted to do a deal with a macro media business that would literally contribute the advertising space for either stock or participation in the product somehow. Right. Be vested in that, in that respect. 
And so we did a really a landmark deal, very a very special deal that had never really been done before in CPG like this. We did a deal with Hearst Media. And, you know, Hearst Media is, you know, this dates back to William Randolph Hearst in the early, you know, 1800s, mid 1800s. He was one of the original newspaper barons and one of the first media conglomerates. And so Hearst today is, you know, they, they're, they're, you know, I think just south of about a $20 billion enterprise. And they've got tremendous banners and properties within their organization. They own things like, you know, good housekeeping. They own, you know, Delish, which is, you know, very, very large platform. They own uh, Cosmo magazine. They're the editors for Oprah magazine. They have a percentage of, a, uh, of, of the AE channel of ESPN. It goes on and on and on. And, and so we did a cross brand collab um, strategic deal with Hearst where they provide an advertising budget for each of our products that's in the millions of dollars on an annual basis. And for that, they get participation in the sales of the product. So you've built this real community around the company right. that is better than going and raising whatever venture capital in X amount. It's, you, know, you got some partners that maybe aren't as strategic. And if you don't spend the money well, then what happens? And it yeah, yeah. sometimes when you remove the capital, it can remove the pressure as long as everyone is, you know, on the same page strategically. And so everybody's got vested interests to make this. So now you put that in a public vehicle. Mm -hmm. And that's so that's a ton of value that we think we can return shareholders you know, over, over, over a not so, you know, distant period of time. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And I think what dif definitely differentiates you, and I think you've highlighted it very well, but I want to tie it in very like nitty, like succinct way is you mentioned it perfectly is you're not just going after any product. You're not trying to go after and just be like, okay, we're going to replicate, let's just say the, the dish soap that Colgate palm olive makes, or you're not going to replicate the tide that Proctor makes. You're really just looking at it and you're like, well, I see a problem with how, maybe not necessarily those two products, but how this product is made. How can we make it more efficient for the end user that really would not just make them want to utilize our product, but makes their life easier to be well, able to, to keep that, right? 100%. Well, look, look, take a look at the brands, right? So, you know, yeah. we've got the, the brand called Breathe, mm -hmm. um, which, which this is, listen, this is the first household cleaning aerosol line that has ever been approved by the EPA's Safer Choice Program in history, globally, ever. And, and so why? And it's because the, 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 the juice in the cans is holistically biodegradable, but, right. but the propellant, the propellant is not a hydrocarbon gas like every other aerosol. It's propelled by compressed air. And so that had never really been done before. And if you'd walk the shelves of the Walmarts and so on and so forth in the world, and you see the sea of aerosols that were available, all the cleaning products and so on and so forth, that's all owned by the big, you know, macro players in the category. None of them had this tech. And so when we presented it to buyers, they were like, wow, you're going to put a green and safe tinge on this sector in our store. And oh, by the way, it's going to now be marketed in a way that you know, isn't sort of the traditional CPG looking, you know, borrow nine or scrubbing bubbles and that right. sort of that old kind of aesthetic. This is done in a way that is beautiful. It's, it's, yeah, it it's, seems, it just it's seems fresh and new, fresh yeah. and new. And there's artistic value and it's quote unquote countertop worthy. And we want to be cognizant of who our marketplace is and who the community is. And if we're, if we're, if we're marketing to families and young families and millennial and younger, you know, we've got to create things that resonate not only from a safety, environmental, and efficacy standpoint, but also stylistically. It was right. really important, and so and so once that became the presentation of the offering, and then you could take a look at okay, well, what are you going to be retailing this for? What are you going to be selling it for? Is it going to be much more expensive? And the answer was no. It could be the exact same or less because we're the OEM it became a slam dunk and we just started to pick up distribution after distribution after distribution. And now it's being complemented with the Hearst media. Right. So it now has the good housekeeping seal of approval. It's being marketed on a good housekeeping seal, uh, a platform and, and through their good housekeeping uh, research Institute and in their magazine and on their platform. And so you're getting, you know, 
30, 40, 50, 60 million impressions on a monthly basis. And now the branding is taking effect. And, right, and you right. can start to see results in our last 10K. And so this yeah. is the trajectory of where the business is headed. Yeah, I definitely wanted to touch on that because I, that, I was like thinking when you were describing this and, and how you're really starting to see it kind of take on of a, a brand recognition and a, and a life of its own. I noticed that when you went from 2019 to 2020, the top line revenue growth of the organization has skyrocketed, I mean, just to say the least. And so yep. uh, not only that, but also the cash position. So I want to touch specifically on the top line growth and what specifically has driven that, especially in the macroeconomic environment that we're in, that is extremely yep. challenging for the micro cap sort of organizations like yourself out there. How have you been able to, to navigate that so well and then I also want to touch on the the large growth in the cash position from 2019 to 2020, and if that was specifically from just the the pure revenue growth that you've been able to see and the margins that you're able to operate at, or if that was accessed by reaching out to capital markets. Yeah. Um, well, first things first, you know, yes, being in this pandemic has caused immense challenges, especially in manufacturing. You know, we had a couple of plants right. that got COVID and we had to shut oh, down wow. for a week and clean. And yes, yeah, so we've, we've, you know, had our hands full. Uh, and luckily, you know, everyone's come through it safely and, and That's good. you know, That's great. we've been back online. Um, but, you know, there was this at the beginning, kind of back in the sort of March timeframe, we went through this, you know, kind of what they called cupboard hoarding, right? And the toilet paper and all this sort of things and people nervous and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, yeah. And, and so when you look at the categories that we're in, especially the Breathe product line, which is, you know, in household cleaning and also in personal care, these really, you know, are considered to be essentials. Right. And essentials became hot. Um, and so all of a sudden, as that, you know, started to kind of peak uh, in the greater populace, and we started to come out at a similar time frame. people started to recognize that a we're going to be they're at home a lot more cleaning's happening a lot more and if there is safer alternatives but we're also either a keeping efficacy the same or improving it and we can do that at the same economic value that started to find its footing and our distribution started to just jump and and so that was on the household cleaning side of Breathe. Now, in our private business, we've been a private little manufacturer of hand sanitizer for years and years and years for, for a really long time. And so, you know, hand sanitizer started to really scale and, you know, in the bulk format. And a lot of the components, the supply chain started to break. And, and we started to realize that we can't even produce the demand on the private label side. Right, right. And so we started, to, we started to look at supply chains that weren't broken as bad as like people needing caps and bottles and things of that nature. And it was really aerosols. And so it dawned on us, why couldn't a hand sanitizer be in an aerosol, especially one that's propelled by compressed air? So we very quickly went and got our legal team and did intellectual property searches and patent searches and it came up very clear and we filed patents right away and then it became just this wonderful line extension off of the breed brand because it was still committing to all the promises of breed and we launched immediately in dollar general at all fifteen thousand stores and was just oh, wow. a monster success and then we put it into the big distributors like unfi and kahi we did deals with home depot and lowe's and wegmans uh the thing just started to scale and 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 it really took the whole line on a consolidated basis as people started to really say okay well what else is available in that breathe line and now it wasn't just about saying okay well we're in household we're in personal care this is about cleaning this is about sanitizing this is about doing it in a way that you feel good about from an environmental vantage point and from a safety standpoint and so once we kind of had that promise, we then said, well, we've got to really double down on this because we've got a tremendous amount of third party testing for the cleaning line that tests us against the national brand competitors. But we right. had to do the same for the sanitizer because this is you're talking about human life. Here. All right. Frontline workers and so on and so forth. This isn't just some dainty product that someone's going to clean at home. There's some real serious application here. 
So what we did is we put it through massive efficacy testing. We put it through all the ASTM tests to show that it kills all the pathogen, uh, all the bacteria. And then we tested it against COVID. And we showed very early that this product kills COVID. And, and at breathesanitizer.com, on, on the, the, the product, the company's website, we publish our testing. If you go on there and you see the testing tab, we publish it for the public. We, 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 we felt a responsibility to do that. Uh, and we became the only company to really do that. Hmm. Uh, and and that was a, it was a huge expense and we had to do it very, very quickly. But being a formulary guy myself and understanding how we were going to put this product together, you know, everyone's like, oh, well, it's just alcohol. Anything over 62% alcohol kills COVID. Well, you know what? It's not true. And, 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 and some people think, well, the more alcohol, the better. Let's put in a 90% or 80%. And guess what? That's not true either. There's actually a very fine line of the amount of alcohol that you require because if you put in too much alcohol and it goes to kill a specific organism or pathogen, sometimes what can happen is that it actually kind of calcifies the membrane of the organism and then prevents the penetration of the alcohol itself so it doesn't kill it. Mm. So you actually need enough water in there for some disability to penetrate the membrane and sort of proverbially drag the alcohol <laughs> in the organism so you get a kill. So there's 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 IP there, there's knowledge yeah, there, there's yeah. you know, and, and so you know we had to be very cognizant of how we want to and the other interesting thing is that this is a spray product, so you're atomizing the product and it actually increases the efficacy of then let's say a thick gel product that you kind of have to goop on and rub in because some of those gels using the thickening agent, some of those gels can actually suspend the alcohol so it doesn't touch the surface that fast enough. And so that rubbing is really, really necessary. Um, with a high atomization, you're creating a droplet size so that the contact time and the potential migrational capability of that, it goes ex exponentially up. And and the other nice, the interesting thing about, about, the, about the spray is that, look, you got to think about sanitizing skin and surfaces. Like that's a very intimate application, right? Especially when you squirt some gel in your hand, you don't see you're not, you don't see a bunch of squirting gel and rubbing down a bunch of people. That's just not the right. That's not the that's not the consumer behavior. Right. But with a but with a spray, what happens is is that, and this isn't it, but this is just some spray, is that you're going to use it on yourself, sure. But now you've got the capability to turn the product onto the world. And that's a first. And so yeah. whatever, mom or dad can take the kids and line up three kids and say, okay, kids, put your hands out and, and get them all in one fell swoop. And if it's good enough for their hands and their skin, it can be good enough for a lot of different things. And, and so we found that to be behavior changing. And that really met the mission. That met the mission statement, right? So new novel, potential patents, tremendous efficacy, efficacy safety, powered by air, and behavior changing. And so once we put that up, I mean, the response has been, I can't, I can't, I can't tell you. I mean, it's, it's, it's been amazing. And, and this is a new piece of information and I can disclose this now um, that we have been chosen. This is as of 10 days, 10 days ago, we have been chosen by Home Depot as now a permanent skew for our breathe spray hand sanitizer. That's in the five ounce. And that's also yeah. in the one ounce, the one ounce travel spray that's going to be at every till and every checkout. So, so it's the product itself, the innovation, the positioning, it's being recognized now as right. best in class and a real staple now in the, in, in the marketplace. And so has that been the, the primary revenue driver for the organization going from 2019 to 2020? Has there been other products as well? The breathe cleaning line for sure, the breathe spray hand sanitizer for sure. But I got to tell you, the other innovation that we launched, which isn't a product that's, you know, saving the planet, but is super fun and not and, and, and not unhealthy, is our Winona popcorn spray. I mean, this product has just, it's done gangbusters. And I think partly for sure that, you know, look, we're all at home more. And it's movie night more nights than it, than it usually was and kids yeah. and having fun and um and and listen it's 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 a very low cal almost negligible like the fda if it's negligible low cal you actually have to put on the label zero cal because they round down very low cal non-gmo butter flavor that's that's an amazing product and and mm -hmm. and and so again what was the landscape 
the landscape with seasoning, right? Shake, shake, shake. But when you shake, 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 it all ends up at the bottom of the bowl. And so this gave someone the capability to slightly change their behavior, great, great uniformity, find great flavor throughout your, you know, the sensory experience of enjoying the popcorn, especially when the popcorn's right. a little bit warm and it starts to sort of steam off. There's an aroma that comes with it. Right. Um, you know, the kids love it. And and so we've seen sales of that product just hockey stick curve and the 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 units per store per week metrics coming out of Walmart were just off the charts. And also our D to C platform on Amazon and direct were just amazing. And then we started to get calls and now, so it's flowing into HEB and their volumes are expected. Okay. Just, so, so that's just starting to scale. And, that's good. and, and, in 2021, we're coming out with new flavors. So okay. what kind of flavors? Online. Caramel, okay. which I, I can tested the samples and like, it's an indulgence. I could like spray it in my mouth. Okay. <laughs> it's like amazing. Um, yeah. And we're also uh, going to do a cheese. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I, I was just thinking about it. I think I told you before, before we actually started the interview that I was looking up the product line and doing my research, you know, before the interview. And I was like, Oh man, I was like, that looks good. I was like, I got to get some of that. And then, you know, you tell me that it's caramel and stuff. I mean, part of growing up, especially around this time, like Christmas time, you know, knowing that, uh, the caramel, you know, popcorn is around the corner like that. That was, uh, and, and the cheese popcorn, that was always something that I grew up with around the Christmas time. That's awesome. So has there been Super any other fun. products or any any other product lines that you're looking to establish that you can disclose? I know there's a IP aspect of things, but there's, uh, there's anything a that you, yeah. Um, I can't say too much. We have just a phenomenal innovation in spirits that will be coming that I, you know, can't get into. Um, <laughs> I'll we, look forward to that got, one. Yeah, we, 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 oh, the one that we can talk about is um, that's going to be, uh, the line's going to be broadening for next year, which is called Hanu. That's our sunscreen. And that's a real unique one that, um, you know, Hanu means sea turtle in Hawaiian. Okay. And so on that sunscreen, it's basically a can like this, but it has an entire arm, a whole ratcheting spray arm that ratchets up and ratchets down. So like you can spray your back and hard to reach areas. And ah, it's yeah. really, it's really designed for, you know, kind of the solo adventure out there uh, or enthusiast, you know, when, when you can't get full coverage and you're out surfing for a day or hiking or mountain biking or golfing, or if you're just, you know, going to be fully out there by yourself, you can really cover all the areas and, and, um, you know, we're a big manufacturer of spray sunscreen. So, you know, we're very cognizant of what these formulas have to have. There's a lot of bad acting chemicals that, that are in there, things called um, oxybenzone, octanoxate, even homosalate. And so we came up with a formulation that doesn't have any of those three, but it's still an SPF 50, but it also has water resistance up to 80 minutes. And so we That's filed patent good. for that formula. And they consider that formula to be reef safe because some of those other like oxybenzone and octanoxate, they think that those are hormone disruptors and they're disrupting some of the reproductive, like that's causing the bleak, the, the, the reefs to not redevelop and can be dangerous. Uh, um, and and it's actually sense. outlawed in Hawaii right now and outlawed in places like the Florida Keys and there's other states to follow. So um, we were ahead of that curve by like three or four years. And so we've got some really inter you know, interesting IP in the formula and also in the patented spray arm. And so that's called Hanu. Um, and the slogan is protect your own shell, like a sea turtle, <laughs> I like but that. there's I other, like that. other skews that are going to be coming out with it. And, and so you can check that one out online as uh, hanusunscreen.com and on Amazon. So again, right. It's got to be behavior changing and the cross category and utilizing the manufacturing. And, um, oh, what I didn't mention was that, um, Winona has done a strategic partnership with our partner Hearst. And they own um, Delish Network and Delish.com, which I think is like number two behind Food Network. It's huge. And so that's a collab. So if you see the Winona now, you'll see on Can it has, you know, Delish, um, Delish Network and it's right on Can. And so there's a play off their media and their impressions and marketing. And there'll be similar, similarly, there'll be one for, for Hanu that um, isn't established yet, but. 
the only other question I guess I have for you is if there's any other final items that you think we might have missed uh, in this interview that you would want somebody who is either one, a potential consumer that would be like interested in your products for the future or folks that are investors mm -hmm. like myself that might be looking at Starco brands as a future uh, investment opportunity for them going forward. Well, what what I would say to that is, and and I'm a, you know I personally invest right. I I have a portfolio of stocks that I'm you know pretty active in, and so when I'm going to deploy my hard earned money, you know what are the some of the questions that I ask, and one of them is kind of let's just ensure we answer the why, right? Like why what and why would I say to somebody, you know, hey, I think. Starco brands is a worthy investment. What's what's the why from my lens? And 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 what I would say is that I think it's really important and probably in any investment, right, is is the due diligence factor. And part of the due diligence here is to really peel the onion to see what's behind the veil and to really understand why this company can manufacture at scale and why this company can develop intellectual property and why this company can access retailers, right? Because this existing infrastructure that we have that we can play off of is very real and very powerful. So that's kind of one. Um, secondly, if, if, if the idea that the mission statement says, we're only gonna commercialize unique intellectual property, things that change behavior. So if, if, if that resonates with somebody and then the company can kind of, you know, put its money where its mouth is and prove they can do that. So right. meaning like commercialize a Breathe or commercialize a Winona or Papa Spray or a Hanu or whatever else is in the pipe. If you think that the company can do that and has done it well, we're only in year three. So you've got a well-financed organization with a tremendous amount of manufacturing capability and we're already developing really cutting edge products that are starting to scale. And so the goal and the ambition of management is to pour gas on that fire and continue to develop in, in other categories. And so, and so ultimately, what does that mean and how does that look regarding valuation? So there has to be some knowledge and there has to be kind of a wink and a nod to say that, well, let's take a look at the comps of in the consumer products categories of, you know, let's say, you know, a company in household or a company in air care or a company in sunscreen or a company in beverage or spirits. If these companies, let's say, started out small and they scaled and their brands were built and their sales were there, what do they divest for to the big boys? And what's interesting in CPG in the branded area is that typically if you've done a good job and you've scaled the business to 30, 40, 50, 60 million and up, those businesses typically trade for a multiple of their top line, not of EBITDA, right? When you get into the manufacturing world and the, and the heavy OEMs and the manufacturers right. and those sorts of things, they trade on multiples of EBITDA and you want to know the historicals and so on and so forth. But in the branded CPG world, they sell for multiples of top line. So you take a look at the company's market cap today, which is you know, somewhere around 270 million. You know, let's say we take one of our products and it goes to, you know, 30 or 40 million in sales. And that sells for a, you tell me, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 times revenue. One product line is gonna show you something equivalent to what the market capitalization says is not six product lines. So, right. so the intent is to build several billion dollars of valuation. And, and I think we've got the ingredients in, in, in the kettle to do that. And so I think that those are the key things to really take a look at, you know, as the company is starting to scale really in its infancy. Mm. Interesting. Would you would you want to spin up those brands one by one or because they all kind of are on that aerosol foundation that you've kind of been utilizing and using your specialty and your IP for, would that be something you want to keep as a whole until either you, you say want to eventually spin it off into one big divestment into a, an organization or something where you would kind of just want to keep it independent for as long as possible? Early in my career, I had a really fascinating uh, billionaire who was a mentor to me. And he said, Ross, always run your business as if you could sell it tomorrow. And what that really means is do a great job of what you say you're going to do. 
make sure you run an efficient and frugal business with amazing products and do it the best and do it the most st strategic. So, so, you know, work smart and work hard about it. And so if you have that in mind where we're relentless, like we're, you know, we're 24 seven. It's the way, like, I've never been a good sleeper, but I, it's 24 seven. We just, it, right. that's the way, that's the way it works with me and my executive and our team. That's the, just the cloth that we're cut from. But if you can do that, what the answer to your question is, is that you'll end up with good options. Whether you want to divest to a big, you know, bigger player that makes a lot of sense for the company at that point in time, or if you're not ready to do that and the value can be captured within the organization, you don't want to make those decisions too early. You just want to run a great business so that you have right. those options. Okay. So keep your, your goal of creating basically behavior changing products in mind and wait till the cards come to you and, Listen, and wait to see what the, what, what you want to do. For, for example, look, we had a very large CPG player make us an offer to buy Breathe like early in the game. Like we were only out to market for like, I think it was like six or seven months early. And we said, wow. I mean, flattered. Thank you. Yes. But no, thanks. We're way too early in the All game right. yet. So it's right. being, you know, it's turning heads out there, you know, already. Yeah, very good. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else or do you want to uh, say anything else before we sign off? No, much appreciated. Um, thanks. Thanks for having me. And, and it's been a lot of fun. Oh, Ross, thank you so much. And hopefully I'll uh, be able to talk to you in future interviews again. Sounds great. All right. Thank you. Thanks.